and we are on the cloud. Over to you, Lena. I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you. So welcome everyone to this uh, special edition of the data conversations. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Lena Karwowska. I work at, as a community manager for research data management and open science at the, at the VU Amsterdam, at the library there. And this session today is a part of uh, the Turing Way book dash. Uh, so Anne and I will be the hosts and we decided to start with a short presentation explaining what the data conversations are and what the Turing way is so that both both communities attending kind of know about each other. So yeah, let's just move to the next slide and uh, I will explain where I'm coming from. So I, I work for the few Amsterdam and uh, my role is to connect research data management uh, to facilitate the research data management community at the FU. And uh, the, the, this uh, community involves a lot of support staff at various, located at various departments of the university. So while I, I work for the library, there are also people involved in research data management who work uh, at the grants office, uh, at the legal department, at uh, various departments of IT, and also involved in uh, valorization. And uh, my role is uh, to connect this expertise and to make sure that if researchers need help, that they actually get the help they need and don't need to go separately to all of these uh, departments and ask if this is the right place for that. Uh, yeah, I guess we can also move to the next slide. Uh, this uh, uh, work I'm doing is... Uh, part of the um, it, like makes us also part of the larger open science community Amsterdam uh, th this is a, uh, this is a actually a bottom up initiative of researchers from UFA who wanted to improve the way research is done and uh, they they started uh, open science community Amsterdam and later other institutions uh, in, in um, based in Amsterdam, like the FU and Javier joined, and uh, together we organize uh, events and trainings. For example, in uh, we, we, we now have a call for uh, Open Science Community Amsterdam Awards Open, so, and we want to uh, award all kinds of projects, not only research, but also um, initiatives in uh, transparency, stakeholder involvement, open education resources. Uh, so if uh, if you're in Amsterdam and have um, a project, please um, consider submitting. And next slide, please. Uh, we organize a lot of trainings and uh, including uh, the, um, writing a data management plan uh, software like programming skills uh, uh, also specific trainings for um, uh, tools like osf and dataverse and we also have organized various training sessions on demand and you can follow uh, all, all our news on twitter and through our newsletters uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have all kinds of uh, events, which uh, which uh, include the data conversations, but also uh, events specifically, for example, for Open Access Week or for Halloween. We try to make something uh, fun, so we make we we make escape rooms. And uh, this year, it was a software horror escape escape room, which you can try uh, on your own if you like. Uh, we also organize uh, events with students, for example, movie nights and uh, student focus, uh, focused open science uh, um, events. Uh, can we move uh, to the next slide? So today is, a, yeah, returning to where, where, where we are here today, this is a few data conversations meeting. Uh, it originally started in 2018 and up since then it was going either over lunch or in online format. The goal of the data conversations was to bring researchers from different parts of the few together and to help them learn from each other about various practical aspects of research process. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, the online uh, meetings are usually recorded and you can find the find watch them back on our youtube channel some of them are really insightful and i recommend taking a look we also deposit our slides uh, at synodo so all this uh, output can be found there uh, i think that's that's my part i'm um, Great. Yes, I believe this was the last slide. Um, thanks so much, Lena. I feel like also through that presentation, I got to learn more about your work too in the process. Um, so I'm going to kind of give us a slapdash zoom through uh, the world of uh, the Turing Way. Um, what in the world all of us are doing in a physical room today? What the book dash is? Um, and then we'll get started with the really fun stuff, which is learning more from our speakers. So with that, so the Turing Way is um, many things. Uh, it is an open source guide on data science. And what this means is that it is a book on one hand, um, but it's also a global community that contributes to it. Um, and we aim um, both on the organizing team, and myself as a community manager, uh, we aim to support uh, a community of folks working in and around data uh, to make data science reproducible, ethical, collaborative, and inclusive. For everyone. And in order to do that, we rely on a lot of open source methods and processes, meaning our project is hosted on GitHub, and we aim to document as much of our own community practices out in the open for folks. Um, and in doing so throughout this whole process, our aim is to really push for a culture of collaboration, um, in many ways to push for a culture shift in research and data science as we know it. So with this in mind, um, it's important to flag here that while we are hosted at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, um, we are hosted at the Turing that we are not exclusive to. Um, uh, Lena, uh, who is co-organizing the session today, is a part of the core organizing team of the Turing Way, as well as um, a member of the Book Dash committee that puts on events like the ones that we are in now. Um, and really, the Turing Way as a project is a compilation and a combination of researchers, contributors, um, experts from really all across uh, the world in many different institutions. And we're really happy to and glad to be able to have uh, the resources to be able to support other folks' work to just like in here. We are hosted by, but not exclusive to. So a little bit more about uh, the Turing Way guides. Uh, so the Turing Way found its origins in a reaction to the crisis of reproducibility in science. Um, Dr. Kirsty Whitaker and a core team of close allies uh, created the Guide for Reproducible Research um, in 2018 um, with the addition of Dr. Malvika Sharon to the project, uh, who was community manager before myself. Um, the one guide of reproducible research expanded into five different guides that are related to project design, communication, collaboration, and ethical research, meaning that we realized how much uh, to enable reproducibility in research, we had to think about the origins of the research project itself, um, how we communicate uh, more broadly to different communities, how we collaborate amidst each other um, as researchers, um, and thinking really about the ethical ethics and um, ethical implications of one's work really all the way through. Um, we also document all of our practices uh, collectively in what's called a community handbook so that it can be used by other open source communities as well. So with this in mind, um, there are many different ways of getting involved in the project, and you'll hear more about the book dash in a second. Um, but we really aim to you know, expand beyond uh, how we think of um, collaborating on an open source project in many different ways. So you can develop and share the resource um, within your own communities. Uh, you can fix a link or a typo, which um, many of us have been doing throughout Book Dash. Uh, you can share this resource amidst um, your own research team or your group. Uh, you can re review and update the guides that we currently have with us. And I will add here a massive, massive shout out uh, to the translation and localization team which was an effort that was started a couple of years ago um, that aims to translate the Turing Way Five Guides and the Community Handbook into um, many different languages and really to, to create a resource that is fit for local context for people's own environments. Um, and I will flag here that we have current translations, um, I believe ongoing in Spanish and Portuguese, in Japanese, Turkish, um, French, and Korean, I want to say. I probably lost a few languages in. And Arabic as well, of course. 
And it's it's really truly an incredible effort and speaks to you know folks creating the tools and the ways of working that um, are meaningful for them. Um, and of course, with all these in mind, the aim is to share uh, best practices and all of these different ways of working. So with all of these things that are thrown your way, um, I will flag here that the way that communication and collaboration um, really works within the Turning Way community is through a series of community calls and events. Um, on a weekly or bi-monthly basis, we have uh, what are called collaboration cafes. Um, we have co-working calls as well, uh, fireside chats on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. Um, but really the crux and the core uh, event of the Turning Way community is what's called a book dash. Um, they're kind of a concentrated period of work within the project uh, where people have time reserved within their schedules, within their everyday life, uh, to be able to you know, make a concentrated contribution of whatever type of project um, in the turn way. And that's what this data to conversation um, co-hosted with Lena is a part of. Uh, we're really excited to be able to, to be a part of, of this um, throughout the week. Um, and we encourage you um, to check out what's called our community share out happening this Friday, um, which is where some folks will be talking about what they've been up to all throughout this week. And you can hear uh, more about the book dash um, itself. So with that, without too much ado, I will say here a big shout out to folks in the Book Dash Planning Committee. I'm a one of a much larger team of people, one of which is Ariel is here as well. Um, if you can wave, I'm not sure if people would able to be able to see that on the screen. Um, Lena, of course, um, and the monitor Book Dash, uh, as well as many other folks who've been popping in and out throughout the day. So I think with that, I'm gonna say one last shout out to really just the, the community of contributors and users who uh, really make the turning way what it is. Um, uh, all of us are a part of this much uh, broader community of folks that have made, written, edited, maintained, translated uh, the turning way guides and community handbook and it really wouldn't be um, what it is without the community and with events, without events like the book dash. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen here and thank you all for a short introduction. So I'll pass it back to Lena to get us started and pass it on to the good stuff, which will be hearing more from our speakers today. Yes, thank you. Uh, so to the, the, the structure of the meeting today is that we will hear two short presentations and after that there will be a joint uh, discussion. And uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Leanne Kimbo. Uh, Leanne is a PhD candidate in Open Innovation, Open Science, Open Data, Data Sharing and Reuse at the Department of Knowledge, Information and Innovation of the School of Business and Economics at the uh, Freie Universität Amsterdam. So we work at the same university. And the title of her talk is The Innovation Process in Biomarkers Discovery, Exploring the Collaborative Context of Myriad. Thank you very much for that introduction. I will go ahead and share my screen. I hope you all are able to see it. Yes? Yes, perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm very um, thankful to have been invited by Lena to join this conversation alongside the Turing Way. Um, so as mentioned, my area of research is within the open science innovation process um, realm. So this, of course, is a very relevant topic for the research that I'm doing, um, which is in the context of biomarker discovery for dementia research. So I'll be speaking to you all today a bit about my current research and how this ties into this broader issue of openness as related to our data. And so to provide a little bit of context, I am working currently within an interdisciplinary group for biomarker discovery to address dementia. Um, this is called the Myriada Project. And within this project, the goal was to develop an interdisciplinary team that collaborates with one another to accelerate dementia research. And in particular, within work package five, which is the work package I'm within, is this idea of process innovation. So how can we facilitate data sharing and reuse and leverage collaboration in order to advance biomarker discovery? And so my role within this um, consortium is to understand actually how data reuse and sharing occurs within this collaborative context. And the reason this is important is because when we look at innovation traditionally, 
uh, especially for those that are not familiar with innovation and the concepts surrounding innovation, they really look at this as a linear process. So seeing on the left-hand side where you, know, you engage in a project and then at the end, you're going to have something innovative come out as an, as an output of your research. But what we know and what we've presented here is that in fact, it looks quite different. So it's more of an emergent or open process and because it's this emergent or open process, it's not a smooth line in understanding how innovation is being developed. And so really here, if we know that openness is important for innovation, if we say that data sharing and collaboration are key to innovation, what we really need to look at is the process. So within these many different paths that can emerge, how do we get, what does innovation mean? What does that look like for how data sharing and reuse occurs in practice? And so within the context of Myriata, the idea of openness and open innovation and how that ties to advancing dementia research um, goes into what the processes are within this con consortium. And one of the challenges that came up in terms of a challenge to openness within the Myriata project it's actually an issue of unavoidable challenges. Um, so in terms of opening the data and sharing and so on, what we found quite early on is that this challenge to be open, so this lack of motivation to be open, was not the case of the problem that we had within the consortium. Rather, we found there to be other practical challenges that were preventing or impeding openness. And so um, the first step in looking at this was, well, we said, okay, we have collaboration, we're going to be open, we're going to share data and reuse data within this um, consortium environment. But there was a challenge of delays in data sharing, which is, as we know, contrary to openness. But in looking at openness and wanting to provide fair data, we can't overlook the restrictions surrounding sharing data. And one of those is GDPR. And what happened with GDPR, of course, this is within the European Union and is focused on not only protecting data, but also ensuring some type of standardization so that there can be a free flow of data. However, in practice, what it appears to be is actually the problem, the cause of data sharing challenges and a re reason to not share data due to concerns around GDPR. So with this in mind and this uh, point of data not being shared because GDPR compliance or because of considerations around that. What I focused on is why is GDPR a challenge to openness? What is happening? And so in looking at that, I asked the question, what is the routine for data sharing within an interdisciplinary consortium? And in particular, looking at what is the role of GDPR within the routine of data sharing? So as related to the collection methods, how do we figure this out? Um, I have been engaging in qualitative data collection, focusing on process research. And what was important about this is to have a gamut of different actors. So not only the researchers themselves, but those that are the principal investigators looking at differences with postdoc research, as well as those that are meant to help the process. So the data steward, the legal department personnel within this process. And so the initial findings, if we recap, the problem is um, data sharing. Data sharing is a, is a challenge, there's a, a barrier, and we think that the barrier is GDPR. Um, and so if we say we should easily have access to data, one of the first findings that I had was that data sharing is not rocket science. So um, within one of the principal investigators, what they highlighted, and this was shared among researchers, is that you know, data sharing, sharing the file itself is not an issue at all. We can be open. We can figure out how to um, incorporate the data that is needed from other researchers. And so it should not be a big problem. And yet what we ended up with is that it wasn't taking place. There were barriers to actually getting that physical data share set shared between actors. So if this wasn't a researcher's issue, perhaps it was something that the data stewards or legal department would know, how do you ensure GDPR compliance? And so in going to them, it was quite a simple process. You make sure your legal agreements are in place, you 
make a data request, you make sure that you have all of the metadata. So this idea, this principle of fairness that's needed, and then you ensure that the data is shared in compliance with GDPR. So it looks something like this, a pretty simple process. However, um, when we look at this, we have two sides. So we have the data can be shared or it cannot be shared. And we have the processes are followed that ensure data compliance. And again, it doesn't appear to be rocket science. However, what we found is that the actual process looked a bit different. And this was due to ambiguity in the data sharing process. So because, and Lena mentioned, researchers not being aware of where to go um, in order to continue on with their research, ensuring how to ensure compliance, how to make their data open, what is metadata? These sorts of questions within the data sharing process created ambiguity. And so when we look at the actual routine, so instead of it being this simple, providing the documents that are needed and the um, agreements needed to move forward, the enacted routine actually occurred without getting some of these formal agreements and approvals. And that was because of these cycles of trying to figure out who to speak to and what was needed in order to ensure GDPR compliance. So what we see is something in from the researcher's perspective that looks a lot more like this. And in the end, um, they don't necessarily make sure that uh, GDPR compliance is absolutely in place before sharing their data which then creates problems later on down the line when they are interacting with the data stewards and legal department to make sure that um, all of the compliance is met. So why is this important? Well, we see that the basic issue of ambiguity is due to the differences in data sharing routines between organizations, um, but also between countries. So if we look at what is required to share data, what metadata is needed, how to protect our data, these, seem, these are issues of fairness on one hand, but also require an understanding of things such as SOPs that exist within so standard operating procedures within organizations to make sure that we don't only have the motivation to share data, but understand what is needed from the side of the data descriptions, so the metadata, as well as on the side of insurance, ensuring compliance, so on the GDPR side. And what we found is that this lack of communication um, between the legal, legal department and data stewards and researchers is really the cause for that. So for instance, at the VU, what we have, and this did not take place within the context of the VU, um, but we do have more of those conversations happening between the legal department, data stewards, and researchers in figuring out how best to work with the data that they have, as well as figuring out how to understand GDPR, understand metadata, and what is needed to move us on to fair practices. But we must keep in mind that this is due to a difference in familiarity of practice. So researchers are not necessarily in ensuring or requesting data from other organizations every day. This is not their work to know um, what is needed or what metadata should be provided um, in requesting data from other organizations in compliance with GDPR. And so that is why making sure that that knowledge transfer happens from those outside of these research groups is important. Because if not, we end up with this deviation from the SLP, which while the end is still getting access to data, we don't get to leverage really making sure that the data is in GDPR compliance and also ensure that we are utilizing the data in a way that makes it um, fair. So sharing metadata, for instance, or providing all of the details regarding that data and also following and documenting the process of um, who has had access to that data, how they may have changed it along the way, which prevents challenges for the stewardship and tracking of our data. So we assume here that GDPR itself at the beginning was inhibiting to data sharing. So actually resulted in openness, I'm sorry, in closeness in terms of data sharing. Uh, but what I'm presenting here is that these issues are due to ambiguity. So we see in practice that a lot of the admin considerations in terms of how we can become more open with our data can be apparent inhibitors to openness and fairness of the data. 
Um, and so what they create are these challenges that moving forward, we'll also have to consider not only in how we can best share our data, but how we can leverage those within other disciplines or perhaps even within other departments of our organizations to make sure that of course we are in compliance, but also that we don't have this um, assumed barrier to openness and to this idea of open science due to um, policies such as GDPR. So I just wanted to share that because I think it is a good case for understanding um, that of course openness, when we look at it as a concept, is one that is um, practical. It's one that we can make sure is um, and active through collaboration and through data sharing. But also we have this other side of those barriers that may not always be documented, those barriers to openness. And so having more of these collaborative means of sharing what is needed for openness in GDPR, as well as other challenges that emerge um, are very relevant. And in this case, we see that even in the life sciences, so in looking at developments of biomarker research in dementia, um, it's a relevant topic and hopefully resonates for with other of you, others of you that may be interested in open science, but perhaps some of, have some of these administrative seemingly barriers um, that you are encountering to your path to openness. So thank you very much. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, so Max, uh, Dr. Maxine McIntosh is the program lead on diverse data at Genomics England, where she works on reducing inequalities in access to genomics-based personalized medicine. She is also the co-founder of the grassroots organization One Health Tech. She is passionate about supporting innovations in the healthcare sector with a particular interest in promoting equality and access to those innovations. And the title of the talk is Equitable Genomic Data in Practice. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is uh, really nice for me because uh, I've been at Genomics England for just over a year now. But prior to that, I was at the Island Sharing Institute. So it's nice to, um, it, even though there's quite, quite a lot of new people, um, it's nice to see kind of new walls, as the same old walls and the same old brands. So uh, nice to be back home. Um, so uh, I guess since I left the Turing, I, I got a big proper job, um, not to say that everyone else who works at the Turing doesn't, but it, it, it was quite a jump for me because I went from effectively writing crappy lines of code on uh, healthcare data that no one was ever going to use or look at um, to uh, running a program that was all around how we can improve equity in genomics. Um, so a £25 million program spread over uh, three years um, and has the, the knotty issue of making one of the most inequitable areas of health uh, uh, and genomics in data as equitable as possible. So that was the task. Um, so one of the, I thought some people in, you know, in this audience might not give two hoots about genomics or might not know very much about genomics. So I thought what I'd do is I'd, I'd focus on a few, I guess, uh, kind of quite core conceptual issues that we grappled with quite uh, early on in the program. And that I think could be relevant to people from lots and lots of different disciplines. So that's the background to it. Do, do, do. So as I show, um, so um, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Genomics England is effectively a part of the UK government. So we are a private company, but we're owned by the Department of Health, which is effectively um, the UK government trying to be kind of quite trendy in their structure of innovation. And um, ostensibly, we're structured in this way to make us um, easier to partner with, with the private sector, particularly um, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and the vision of what Genomics England is or does is that we provide effectively the back end to what is called the Genomic Medicine Service, which is a live clinical service across um, the healthcare system in the UK, that if you have cancer or rare disease, you are offered genetic testing. And then for participants who um, consent to their data being used for research, that then goes into a research environment. And the idea is that we kind of reach this like heady goal of um, uh, kind of feeding live research and insights into a kind of live clinical service. So this kind of infinity loop of, of feeding back insights and care. Um, at least that's the ambition. Um, so, as I said, uh, I run an initiative called Diverse Data, which is all around improving the diversity of the genomic data that we have. Um, specifically, this is in England. Um, so the end of the program is all around reducing inequalities and we've got kind of three main outcomes. One is around trust building to date um, for groups who've been excluded from precision medicine efforts. Another one is stimulating the research community to, to think more and do more um, with, I guess, the genomic information that to date hasn't been used. And then large, lastly is around um, improving, kind of have, having direct measurable improvements in, in clinical 
um, outcomes, particularly diagnosis and prognosis. Um, I, I suspect we'll be setting ourselves up for failure if we think we can have lots of impact on care in the next two years. Um, values, that's what we're going for. So, so as a programme, we're structured in, in four main work streams. So, so kind of the how of how we're going to address this problem. Um, and I'm not going to go into too, too much detail, but there is structured into research discovery, engaging with communities. So that's communities, both at the kind of grassroots patient level, but also, I guess, engaging in kind of initiatives and in, in institutions like the Turing to make sure that every organisation in, in some way or another has a sort of data diversity question and initiative and activity in their area, because um, be it genomics or shopping or transport, there's always a data bias problem in our organization um thirdly uh our work stream is around data and sequencing this is the kind of the most expensive bit of the program this is where we're going to be doing quite a lot of whole genome sequencing and then fourthly um building products tools and behaviors which i think is particularly relevant here for um uh, like the turing way plus type community and probably many people on this call so um, we're very much in the market of kind of addressing inequalities in, in uh, data-driven health. Um, we see this across lots and lots of different areas. Certainly in the UK, it's becoming increasingly more significant. Um, there was a kind of national uh, uh, investigation led by the Secretary of State um, on the back of the fact that medical devices are increasingly seen to perform less well in individuals of minority ethnic background. Um, but in reality, actually, and I'm, again, I'm preaching to the converted here, but whilst we often talk about data, we talk about bias models, actually the way in which bias can creep into these systems um, is really quite heterogeneous. Um, and it's everything from, you know, uh, automating systemic biases to setting up studies in a specific way. There's is a very, very complex way in which um, bias can enter into any data-driven system in health. Um, so why diverse data specifically in this context? If you're not in the world of genomics, um, you might not know this. If, you're old, if you are in the world of genomics, you will have seen this graph about a million times. So I'm really, really sorry. So um, the number of individuals included in GWAS studies has kind of absolutely exploded over time. And you know we're on an exponential trajectory of statistical power here, which is very good for science. But actually, when you look into the kind of the makeup of what this graph is showing, um, we really just have a dominance of individuals of European ancestry. So, so the red here is individuals who are of European ancestry. When we say European, we kind of really mean like Northwestern European. Um, and whilst, you know, in the kind of 2014, there was like a mild improvement uh, in, in the proportion, um, and this was from East Asian contributions, so, so predominantly Chinese, and um, really that hasn't um, stood the test of time in terms of a positive trajectory. Um, so this for us is like the big data bias problem that we're really trying to address um, in this program. Um, I'm going to canter through this a, a wee bit. So, but obviously this is obviously nested in the fact that lots of our healthcare is inc increasingly becoming digitized. It's obviously been quite a turbulent couple of years um, looking at axes of inequalities in society, particularly around ethnicity. Um, and in genomics, it's quite a kind of heady mix of complexity in terms of there's lots of national initiatives being set up to do kind of national based sequencing and every country's kind of got its own. Um, there's a narrative around diversity is really just uh, capturing human genetic variation. Um, and then uh, you've got a kind of uncomfortable and suddenly everyone who's based near the Eastern Road, um, close proximity in history of uh, the, the godfathers of eugenics. Um, uh, so at the bottom, you've got Galton. So make sure you know your council statisticians because they're, they're often down the road. Um, so, so this is the backdrop to the, to the environment in which this, this, this work is happening. Um, and so one of the things I wanted just to just talk about is that um, you know, lots of people on this call will care about making data science more equitable, making it open, making it fairer. And that, in some respects, feels inherently like noble and good. Um, but everywhere we look, we kind of realize that um, decisions we made could introduce biases in ways that we might not like or notice or, or really realize. And so there's a particularly nice phrase that I think captures quite well the, the sort of knot we found ourselves in, which is we must always expect science to be misrepresented, overstated and misunderstood because it's complex, because the data is unending and because people are strange. And it's one of the things that every time we started to make key decisions around this program, we thought, God, like every, you know, it's like whack-a-mole with moral dilemmas here. And, and I guess the scary thing for me is that I went from, you know, writing lines of code and writing papers, which, you know, the worst case scenario is someone could kind of misrepresent your paper, to the decisions we were making were shifting tens of millions of pounds worth of funding. So it felt like the stakes were quite high in terms of the decisions we were making around equity. Um, so as a reminder, you know, this is not just a data problem. There is a whole pipeline by which bias is in, in, enter a system. And so these are just some of the ways we started to think about addressing it. So decision number one is how do you define who is underrepresented? So again, I've, I'm, a lot of this is being used in the context of genomics, but I've, I've tried to make it as general as possible so that if you give like no hoots about genomics, it's still relevant to you. 
Um, so first of all, we did a review which said, OK, well, when we look at the literature, what what counts as underrepresented? Who counts as a minority here? And it was just like a total wild west of definitions. Some people were talking about ancestries. So ancestry is, is a crude, sorry, ethnicity is a crude proxy for ancestry, if you've never heard of ancestry before. Um, but, you know, the, the definitions of ancestry was all over the place, the ways in which we we're drawing circles around it. Some people were saying ethnicity when they actually meant ancestry. Some people were saying, well, actually, the main thing is just around taking an intersectional lens and we should be incorporating sex and gender and age. And then other individuals are saying, well, actually, the biggest driver of outcomes is around your postcode and not your genetic code. So that should be the focus. And actually, I think the point is that um, there isn't a consistent way of defining diversity. Diversity is a thing that you need to define depending on what your outcome is. So unless you have a very clear outcome that you know you want to gun for, you have to select an axis of diversity that matters to you. You can't just simply say a group is diverse or not diverse. For example, in the UK, if you are of African ancestry, you are a minority. If you are of African ancestry and you are based in Africa, you are not a minority. That's a very kind of flippant statement, like sentence to say, but you cannot have a globally relevant and generalizable definition for diversity that simply does not exist. So a really good example of how this manifests in genomics is that um, many people I guess, who I think I, like sit in the genetics world don't have this kind of data ethics lens. And again, I think many people in this room will know that data are not neutral. They represent key decisions that we make as flawed, biased, racist, misogynistic human beings. Uh, and without recognizing that these data sets encode these social values is, is quite a big problem. So what one of the examples that means in, in genomics is taxonomies. As part of diversifying genetic data, one of the things we think about is how do we group and categorize human beings? Um, some of you might not know, but the notion of race and ethnicity were created to justify slavery and colonialism. And, and those categories of us grouping human beings is still something we use today for no really good reason. You know, the color of your skin is not really genetic. It's you know, mildly in terms of the melanin, but really the, the, the notion of race and ethnicity in the context of genetics is completely irrelevant. And, yes, and yet we keep leaning towards these paradigms of sorting human beings that have both ugly histories and irrelevant uses now. And so without recognizing that just this, this need to group human beings has this ugly history, and if you're running a genetics program and you don't address these two issues, then you're kind of setting yourself up for, for potential failure. So one of the things we did is we kind of went around and asked everyone in the organization, if you had say 25 million pounds in three years, um, where would you prioritize your efforts for um, um, addressing a data gap? And some people came up with saying, well, actually, really, we should be trying to be representative of the UK ethnicity population. And other people were saying, well, you know, really, it's about, uh, you know, addressing the wrongs of the past. And if a group has been really excluded to date, you should really be doubling down and investing in those groups. Other people were saying, well, really, you should be investing in groups that if you were to help can create more data and, 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 and drive more research through, would have the best cost savings to the NHS. Again, the point is that people brought different value sets to answering this question. So we took all those different definitions of diversity and we assessed them against common bioethical principles. And then we kind of came up with a matrix whereby we kind of evaluated different ways of thinking about diversity. And this was quite a good way of saying there's not a wrong or right way of thinking about what is who and what is underrepresented in, in data and data science. Another way of kind of talking about this is like your definition of fairness or your objective function, depending on how statistically minded you are. Um, but without going through a kind of active and systematic process to recognize the values that are driving your decisions, you could inadvertently, with a very well-intentioned program and process, um, you know, bias uh, or, or, or disadvantage certain groups when you might not have intended to. Decision number two is what even was a bias? So we're, we're supposedly meant to be de-biasing genomics. And actually, we don't really know where we should be looking for in the first place, because we could, one hand, be addressing you know, huge issues of systemic racism. On the other hand, we could be addressing like tiny little issues around data access um, for certain data sets. And, and you know, those are quite different types of problems. So we didn't really know, know where to start. Um, so we did the things that many people do. We'd start to kind of look at our data within our own data sets of genomics thing and say, well, were, were there any signals of, of discrepancies? And we thought, well, actually, on further analysis, we found that, you know, just in cancer, for example, which is one of our main data sets, broadly, we're representative of what we'd expect the UK population to be. On further analysis, we found a, a kind of small bias in the way that our variants were tiered. Um, but, you know, really, like representativeness seemed like about as what one would expect, which was a bit of a problem because we thought, well, Literally, the, the, the point of the uh, uh, program was to address potential ancestral and biases, yet we're seeming to perform quite well. So then we stepped back and we said, well, OK, the, the kind of standard scientific way of just like doing a exploratory analysis into the rates of stuff isn't yielding good results. Um, 
let's think about what a kind of health equity audit looks like. And so a designer in our team, Sophia Lu, who's um, a fantastic and creative creature, she um, effectively created a map of all the processes in the organization. So top right, you can purposely, it's too small for you to actually see because that's basically airing our, our dirty laundry. But what you're looking at is a step-by-step -step process of our diagnostic pipelines. And within that, she has marked every single um, kind of key activity and decision that happens in our pipelines and where that may or may not introduce a source of bias. Um, and this has been a pretty quite helpful process because it's basically created a massive backlog of all the biased potential biased systems and biased processes and biased decisions we have that we could maybe in a small way address. And if we address it's kind of death by a thousand paper cuts, we'd, we'd bit by bit reduce the layers and layers of potential bias exist within a system. But looking for bias and looking for opportunities for health equity um, is not something that you know, the industry is particularly good at. We don't really know where to look. Um, and so just going through this again, more hypothesis free way of thinking about bias was quite an important one for us. And then we decided to kind of turn this into a, like a slightly overextended metaphor. So what you're looking at is, is the bias building. And it was how do we represent layers of bias? So uh, on the far left, we've got kind of big macro issues. Um, so the bottom is any data that goes into the, the John Mix England. And then by the time you get to the helicopters, it's the way in which data is processed. Um, you know, by the time you get to the helicopters, like that's the end of the pipeline. Um, the middle floor is you're, is you're looking at kind of a blueprint of decisions and then you know on the right you're looking at um kind of flower pots and and and, and rugs in a room and that could be things like uh, if you have a special character in your name it on average takes two weeks longer for you to get access to our um data and that's because of the kind of computer says no problem you're much more likely to be non of non-british heritage if you have a uh, special character in your name. So that's like a tiny, tiny thing but again you can just see how the layers bit by bit mount up to create a system of inequity. So lastly, um, obviously the, the data imbalance is pretty massive, um, as we can see by Ancestry, um, but that's obviously not just the answers. You can't just simply collect more data and expect that the problem will go away. Um, a good issue uh, and a, or a good example of that, and anyone who's ever done any gen genetic analysis will know that um, uh, it's quite easy to simply exclude non-Europeans from your analysis because it makes the data less met it makes the data less clean it makes your results you know often less accurate um it makes them less generalizable so it's just easier to exclude those individuals from analysis that, that's that happens all the time although albeit you know less and less now that's not a data problem that's a behavioral problem so that's a kind of really common example of, of, of ways in which we can influence the system to be better that doesn't simply involve collecting more data so we felt that quite a lot of attention had been given to the to the data bit of things and that uh, there was increasing uh, I guess, uh, attention awareness to the systemic issues. And so we thought, well, actually, if you are Joe Bloggs sitting in your garage in the middle of Shropshire, how what, you know, do you know what you need to do personally to make your work as equitable as possible? So I've taken a line from Turing Way here, and it's really around how do you make working in genomics um, uh, equitable and make it too easy not to do. So we create an initiative called Link23, which we'll be hoping to work with um, the Turing Way on as well. And really, this is around how we collect and collect tools to make genomics as equitable as possible. So here are tools, everything from a software package to address like sample imbalances in genomics to a handbook with how do you speak to kind of Papua New Guineans about genomics. Like for us, both of those extremes are tools. If it's practical support to make your life easier and make it easier to do equity work in genomics, um, then it counts as a tool for us. And so we've just launched it. It's a kind of link23.world. Um, we're going to be uh, starting all the kind of community building, community infrastructure, defining terms, defining standards, defining metadata labels, doing data dives on how to actually create all these tools. All of that is about to start. We've only just launched. Um, but really that's um, building on the notion of the fact that Sharing data internationally, I think Leanne work even within a smaller context to outline that very well. Sharing data internationally is very difficult. Collaborating on data internationally is very difficult, but at least working on tools together internationally is a wee bit easier. Um, so I'm going to finish there, but that gives you hopefully a canter through some of the kind of big uh, equity type of decisions we work through as a program, and also how we're kind of incorporating some of the open tools, open science components into, into solving this issue. Um, and yeah, I, I, I get my job is just writing emails now, like an amazing, brilliant team of people do all the actual thinking. Um, and I guess the only last thing is if you are interested in knowing more about um, why uh, data diversity matters in genomics and health. And we've got a very cool uh, kind of crowdsourced storyboard um, at mindthegap.health, which kind of gives summaries of research and analysis and poetry and data visualizations. And basically, we're weird and wonderful ways to talk about data bias and health. Um, so by all means, have a, have a reread of those. And I will stop there. So I suspect it went a bit over time. So sorry about that. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. It's uh...